All right. Uh, I'm Martin Selbaum, uh, as some of you know, and uh, I've been asked to uh, introduce Dr. Patrick, uh, our second uh, uh, master lecturer today. Uh, and it's with great honor and pleasure that I introduce Dr. Chris Patrick. Uh, he's uh, currently a professor uh, at uh, Florida State University uh, and uh, has been really been a person who's been involved in many different areas within clinical psychological science. Uh, he started out as a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, where he graduated, I believe it was 1987. Right. I'm, I'm trying to do this from here, so I might be somewhat inaccurate. He, start, he started out as a lie detection expert uh, for his PhD in studying if psychopaths could beat the lie detector, but from there, uh, he's very much taken his uh, psychophysiology work uh, into many different domains of understanding uh, psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, substance abuse, and other uh, types of externalizing conditions. And I know that this society is really uh, interested in multi-method assessment, and I think uh, Chris very much takes that very strong approach, considering things from, from uh, both the clinical self-report, interview data, psychophysiology, cognitive markers, as well as affective and cognitive neuroscience. So he really tries to put it all together in, in an effort to kind of advocate for using these multi-method approaches to better understand clinical phenomena. And, and I could go on and on and on, but I'm pretty sure you'd rather hear from Dr. Patrick. So without further ado, Chris Patrick. Uh, well, thanks for coming to my talk today. Thanks for the warm introduction, Martin. And I uh, wanted to mention, uh, probably some of you are aware of it, but Martin is this year's recipient of the Malone Mid-Career Award uh, from APA for his work in personality science. So congratulations to Martin. Um, and I, I guess if I'm going to dedicate this talk, I would dedicate it to people who are maybe starting out in this field and who are interested in kind of moving things forward in the future in terms of how we assess individual difference characteristics in general and especially how we relate individual difference characteristics uh, or assess them in terms of their relevance to clinical disorders or clinical problems. So the title of my talk is Multi-Method Assessment of Susceptibility to Psychopathology. I'm going to be talking about a particular way of thinking about and assessing traits uh, as related to clinical problems. And uh, hopefully uh, some of you might be inspired to get involved in this type of work because there are resources available to do it um, for uh, pr pretty much anybody who wants to. Uh, I want to acknowledge some key uh, intellectual influences and collaborators over the years. I went to school, as, uh, to graduate school, as Martin said, at the University of British Columbia. And there I was fortunate to have some key figures in the personality assessment area, personality research area, uh, especially Jerry Wiggins. Um, and uh, he wrote a very influential book uh, published in 1973 called Personality and Prediction. Uh, people might think of this as an older book now, but uh, if you haven't read it, even if you're sort of near the start of your career, especially uh, if you are, I'd really encourage you to read it. Uh, Wiggins, in turn, was influenced by Timothy Leary's book, uh, published in 1957, called The Interpersonal Diagnosis of Personality. Uh, some of you may know uh, Timothy Leary as kind of an acid head guru of the 60s, but he was actually a very um, accomplished personality researcher, and this is a, a really terrific, interesting book. Uh, in addition to Jerry Wiggins, uh, Jim Russell uh, was there at the time I was a graduate student. I took a course from him. He's still there. And uh, also Del Paulus. So you can kind of see what um, level of of representation we had in the personality area at that time. Uh, I also, also want to mention uh, doctoral and postdoctoral mentors. Uh, my dissertation advisor for the lie detector study I did on psychopathy was Bill Iacono. I've collaborated for Bill, with Bill for many years. He's been a major inspiration as far as how to do very hard-nosed, um, sort of neurobiologically oriented research on individual differences in psychopathology, and I continue to collaborate with him uh, to this day. Uh, Peter Lang also, I, I spent my postdoc with him and collaborated, have collaborated with him for a number of years. He's a master experimental psych psychologist uh, with applications to clinical problems, especially anxiety disorders. So I learned a lot from my work with Peter. And then I want to mention a couple of other uh, key University of Minnesota colleagues. I was at the University of Minnesota from 1999 through 2009, and that really changed, uh, sort of at, at my point of mid-career, changed my thinking about a lot of things and kind of led to a lot of new paths for me. 
So I want to mention Alka Telegan, who just walked in here. I'm very happy that Alka is able to join us for uh, the talk today. Uh, he's was, been a major inspiration to me for many years in a lot of ways. And then Bob Kruger, who's kind of a newer kid on the block, but a uh, very highly accomplished uh, researcher, also quite a talented musician. We played in a band together at the University of Minnesota for a number of years, and he guests on a society band that we have for the Society of Physi Psychophysiological Research once in a while. So Kruger's a very interesting uh, person, great sense of humor, and someone I've learned a lot from working with. These are my current lab members, graduate students, and my postdoc, Jens Phil. Phil. So they've all contributed in various ways to the work that I'm going to talk about now. And uh, before I kind of launch into the talk, I want to just, by way of background, talk about some um, kind of trends in contemporary research on psychopathology, mental disorders, uh, psychological disorders, whatever you want to call them. One is, is that there has been quite a strong emphasis and interest in neurobiological mechanisms, quote, mechanisms or causes. And as you all know, a lot of focus on um, neuroimaging and uh, genetic pr approaches. Um, first, the uh, candidate gene approach as well as behavioral genetics and more recently genome-wide association studies. Uh, there have been major funding, uh, federal funding agency initiatives that have focused on this sort of idea of how can we bring neurobiological measures more into um, assessments of psychopathology and conceptualization of uh, problems of that kind. And uh, I'll come back to this at, towards the end. There have also been increasingly um, these large-scale consortium studies that have been launched to study the interface between um, more standard uh, report-based assessments of clinical problems, personality traits, and so forth, and both brain and task behavioral kinds of measures. And these would include the Human Connectome Project, uh, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development uh, Project, or the ABCD Project, which is a NIDA-funded uh, project, and the European Imogen Study, which I'll come back to towards the end, which is a la large, uh, over 2,000 subjects involved, longitudinal beginning at age 14 and continuing on into adulthood, uh, study that includes a variety of types of data, including a, a neuroimaging assessment. So um, what I'm going to talk about is how people in this audience could begin to use data from these types of studies to advance our, our sort of approaches to assessment and ways of understanding uh, clinical phenomena. Um, there are some major issues that come into play when you are talking about this question of how do we measure liability or um, susceptibility to psychological disorders using physiologic measures, for instance, or task behavioral measures. Uh, there are basic methodological challenges involved here, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, an issue is, is that progress actually towards doing this has been slow, progress in identifying reliable biological indicators of problems or susceptibility to problems has been slow and unsystematic. And that's part of the reason for these uh, federal agency funding initiatives, is because people who run the shows and look at all the data that's being collected and findings have been very dissatisfied with progress in this area. So uh, some of these initiatives are a response to that. And it remains really fuzzy as to what role neurobiological measures might ever play in routine clinical evaluations. How do we actually translate the bench findings into bedside uh, procedures for everyday use in the clinic? So the, the central point of my talk, um, which I make to all kinds of audiences, but I hope will hit home, especially this audience, which is a personality assessment group is, is that the issues I just mentioned and all the challenges confronting the use of neurobiological measures in, in psychological assessments can be addressed by applying classic psychometric principles and methods to the study of what I'll call neurobehavioral trait constructs. So I think of a special type of trait, try, a special type of trait construct, what I will refer to as neurobehavioral trait constructs. Other people have used this term in the literature, but not quite in the way I'm using it. Uh, that that can be the focus of, of study on those types of traits can be kind of a key towards connecting up clinical problems with neurobiological uh, systems and measures. So I have a paper that's coming out in a special issue of psychological assessment that Martin um, co-edited, co and the title of the paper is Incorporating Neurophysiological Measures into Clinical Assessments, Fundamental Challenges and a Strategy for Addressing Them. So my talk is going to be kind of about what this title says. How do we do that? What are the challenges that face us? 
what's a systematic strategy that we as assessment researchers as a whole could take towards this, this challenge. So I'm going to start with a definition of neurobehavioral traits in terms of the way I'm thinking about it, and I'll, this will probably become more clear as I talk about fi findings and data. Uh, I would characterize neurobehavioral traits, I'll abbreviate at some points as NB traits. Um, these are traits that would influence classes of behavior that are theorized to, to be linked to uh, distinct evolved adaptive systems of the brain. So the idea here is, is that there are characteristics of people varying along a continuum that have to do with the activity or reactivity of certain systems of the brain that would govern broad classes of behavior. And that to some degree we get at these with lexically based traits, but less directly than we could. And that's what I want to kind of illustrate. So an example of what I would characterize as a neurobehavioral trait would be threat sensitivity, which in kind of colloquial terms you can talk about as fearfulness versus boldness a continuum of proneness to react to acute aversive stimuli or situations with defensive action mobilization. What do I mean by that? I mean engagement of the system of the brain that relates to preparing us for uh, getting out of a situation that may be th potentially dangerous or harmful to us or also starting us to get ready to confront it if we need to. So we hypothesize that there are individual differences in the sensitivity and reactivity of this sort of basic threat uh, reactivity system. And our idea about neurobehavioral traits reflects a realist position on traits. That is, we view traits as psychobiological networks or structures that would encompass internal representations of percepts, uh, sort of sensory kinds of images or experiences, actions and reactions. So there are, you could say, response nodes within these networks. And also semantics or semantic kinds of representations and that these psychobiological networks or structures can affect measured variables in different domains of measurement or different modalities. So that definition hopefully might sound familiar to some of you. Can anybody identify this person here? Who? Kelly, Kelly? okay. Uh, anyone else? Allport, okay. So uh, this is Gordon Allport. And Allport spent a lot of time uh, on this definition of traits and sort of kind of like Walt Whitman who wrote his poems and then revised them a lot over time to kind of get them hopefully closer to the truth. Allport revised and revised the definition and finally came up with this definition. Personality is the dynamic organization within the individual of those psychophysical systems, and I, I'm highlighting that, that determine his characteristics, behavior, characteristic behaviors and thoughts. Um, so that's Allport, and some of you may recognize this uh, individual. This is a rapper, Lil John. And he's saying, what? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to try and make clear through the work that we've done the concept that Allport was talking about when he talks about these psychophysical, um, psychophysical systems. So uh, here's a quick outline of my talk. I'm going I'm to address some of these or, briefly talk about some of these methodological issues. One of the major things I do in the article I mentioned for psych assessment is to really uh, cover these methodological issues in a lot of detail. So that's kind of the, the, the biggest sort of account I've given of all the methodological issues that, that face us in doing this type of work. So if you want a, a fuller, more detailed explanation of all that or discussion, um, you can check out that article. But I'm going to refer briefly to some key ones. Then I'm going to talk about what I call a psychoneurometric research strategy. So in order to develop what I'm going to describe as, as sort of models for getting at psychophysical structures, as Alper talked about them, we need a, we need a new measurement strategy. We, we, need a, we need to go at this in a systematic way that involves basic measurement principles, um, I, I would argue. There's other ways of doing it, like, for example, with machine learning. But we all know historically about these debates that have to do with like measuring things through sort of pure brute and empirical force as opposed to like construct based assessment. So I would say that in, in the sort of current um, sort of excitement about machine learning is going to come around to sort of the recognition that there are issues with that type of purely empirical approach and that a construct based approach is going to both lead to progress in prediction and also understanding in a way that 
sort of purely empirical methods may not. And these, a lot of these issues have been played out in the personality literature over the years, and that's why it's useful to go back and read uh, books like, like um, Wiggins, Personality and Prediction, because uh, smart people have thought about these issues and addressed them, um, Alka and, and others in their work. I'm going to talk about multi-method measurement models for core neurobehavioral traits. So the purpose of the psychoneurometric research strategy is to come up with multi-method measurement models for traits of interest. And in talking about this, I'm going to talk about a critical role that personality assessment experts can play in developing these multi-method models, refining them, and then also translating these models into clinical assessment protocols. So developing these multi-measurement method models, the goal again is how do we best connect up personality trait constructs that have relevance to psychopathology, how do we connect those up with neurobiological systems constructs and task behavioral kinds of measures? Well, the question beyond that is once we have these models, how do we translate them into clinical practice? So I'll come back to that at the very end. Uh, but first, talking about methodological issues, um, First of all, I'm going to highlight a conventional approach to relating traits or disorders, individual difference characteristics, to biological or behavioral variables. So the conventional approach is to quantify the attribute that we're interested in. I would think of a disorder or a symptom sort of count of a disorder as an individual difference characteristic like a personality um, trait score might be. So first of all, we work to quantify whatever the characteristic is that we're interested in. And then we turn around and map various uh, measures of interest, including like, for example, task behavioral, neuropsychological, physiological, brain structural, functional, hormonal, et cetera. We map those onto the measure of the construct that we've, the individual difference um, construct that we've developed. And it's almost always measured through some report-based measure either self-report questionnaire or clinical rating or informant rating or something of that kind. And the idea here is, is that by identifying correlates of that characteristic, uh, say symptom variable or uh, self-report trait, we will advance understanding of that um, characteristic. So this is kind of a depiction of that method. We get a, we get a conceptualization of the trait or disorder we come up with a way of quantifying it uh, or operationalizing it. And then we ask what are its correlates uh, in other response modalities. So everything is kind of centering around this, this um, trait or disorder conceptualization and, and measure. But there are some issues with this. And this is part of what I, why I think that people have been frustrated in their efforts and progress has been slow in doing what I, what I started off to talk about. One is method variance. Traits or disorders and biological and behavioral variables are almost always assessed in different measure, measurement modalities. So we assess traits or disorders through report measures, report-based measures. Um, Although at lunch, someone brought up the question of projective measures, so that's a good point. Projective measures, you could say, are more in kind of the realm of behavioral responses from which we make inferences. But I think the argument that I'm going to make applies as well to those types of assessments. But the most typical type of way we would assess for um, clinical problems or for traits is through self-report or uh, other report. Um, we know from classical, classical um, measurement writings, going back to Campbell and Fisk and others, that if we, if we measure two similar constructs in different measurement modalities, we'd expect a moderate level correlation if it's a very similar construct. But when we talk about a brain variable from a task or a performance measure from a task, it's really not the same construct we can, we're hoping to get at or we can even expect to get at. It's only going to be a, a somewhat related construct. So that means the correlations we can expect between a task behavioral measure or physiologic measure and a report-based measure of a characteristic like um, depression symptoms is probably going to be 0.1 to 0.3, around maybe 0.1 or 0.2 at best. And we see all kinds of reports of higher correlations than that, but they're almost invariably in smaller samples. And when you get to larger samples, which people are starting to look at increasingly, those relationships are actually quite low. And it makes sense from a measurement standpoint. If you measure something that's only loosely related using a different type of measure, it's not going to correlate very well. 
another issue is, is that although people devote a lot of time and attention to evaluating the psychometric properties of report-based scales, uh, biological and task behavioral variables are often of unknown reliability. Until recently, people haven't devoted a lot of attention to assessing the inter individual difference reliability of something like amygdala activation to fear faces. There are some papers starting to appear on that, but there's been years and years of research that has been using amygdala reactivity as a, as a dependent variable in studies of psych pathology without any idea about its reliability. And uh, these, kind of more critically I would say that, or as critically, these kinds of measures, biological and task behavioral variables, are not validated in relation to one another. So although we know something about things, individual variables that would correlate with something like proneness to schizophrenia or proneness to depression, almost never do people take more than one measure and ask about their relationship and what construct they might be getting at in a convergent discriminant validity kind of um, uh, context. And then a third issue that I'll mention is that the trader disorder, the report-based attribute, is treated as the criterion and so is not subject to revision. People would revise maybe based on factor analyses or new psychometric data from the, from the realm of the self-report, but people do not revise the character, characteristic based on the neural or, be, neural or behavioral data. So I'm going to talk about sort of the idea that we could actually start to use data from other methods or other modalities to change the way we conceptualize the construct, because it is a construct. The construct itself can, can shift depending upon what its indicators are and how we want to operationalize it for a particular purpose. So that's the background, and I'm going to get more concrete now. I want to start talking first about this idea of a psychoneurometric um, research strategy. This is the approach that we've been using to try and build these multi-method models, and that I would invite other people to start thinking about in relation to data sets they have access to or could get access to. So this is an alternative approach to relating traits or disorders to biological and behavioral variables. First of all, we treat the trait or disorder, which is assessed through self-report or rating uh, measure, as a provisional referent, as a starting point. Then sort of in a conventional way, we map other variables onto that trait or disorder, but not as a fixed sort of absolute criterion, but as one that can potentially change, and I'll show you how. And so once we know about more than one variable that correlates with our trait or disorder characteristic, we can start to ask about the structure of those variables that are correlates, the indicators. And that will help to clarify the network of their relationships. And then based on the structure of the, the variables that we see in another domain of measurement or other domains of measurement, based on their structure, we can start to shift our idea of what the trait might look like so that might cohere more with what we're seeing as the biological or behavioral data. And the goal here is to advance understanding of the trait or disorder cons as a construct and surrounding constructs in a way that we can define the construct using different indicators for different purposes. So just to illustrate this, and I'm going to show you, you know, some examples of sort of models that we've developed in this way. Um, here we have a rating variable. It could be a trait. Uh, something like anxiousness or fearfulness, and it could be a disorder, um, say a symptom count of the number of symptoms of antisocial personality disorder, or depressive um, uh, depression, Beck depression inventory um, symptoms. And so the first strategy is kind of in a, or first part of the strategy in a conventional way is to identify replicable physiological indicators of that rating based individual difference dimension. And I would say that in the work that we've done on neurobehavioral traits, we've actually stacked the deck by, by trying to develop measures, scale measures that relate, that, that, that define a trait that we know will have biological correlates. I can't go into all the details of that, but the examples that I'll provide you with are ones that were sort of bootstrapped from knowing about report-based measures that related to physiological response indicators and trying to develop a scale that would best account for the relationships we're seeing with with one or more physiologic variables. So you can, you, you can start with scales, and it's a little more efficient that way, to start with a scale that you, you know it has or is likely to have physiological indicators and work from there. 
But, but even if you know of some physiological indicators, you want to know about others, and that's just a question of gathering data and asking about relationships and replicating them. And then you can identify multiple indicators of something that would be a scale measure of something like anxiousness or depress depressivity. Once you do that, then you can start asking about the intercorrelations among the non-report-based indicators of that scale. So in this particular case, we started off with a, uh, a report-based measure. We found six indicators, but when we look at those indicators, they actually form two factors. That is, some of the indicators relate to one another and others sort of together in a different way, suggesting that there are maybe two neural processes or neural characteristics that relate to that scale measure which we've developed to be more unidimensional. And so those, that data then can feed back into reconceptualizing, thinking about psychologically, what, given the task and given the measures that we're talking about and their covariance, what's the characteristic, what is the characteristic they're getting at? And there are, are there items within the self-report measure that actually relate more to that subset of indicators than others? And through that process, you can begin to revise your conceptualization of the psychological construct or, or, or attribute and think about how to refine the scale or revise the scale to get at uh, aspects of it that may, may relate to one set of physiological measures or another. So you can allow the structure of the non-report based indicators to help revise the way we think about the trait. And that's, that's a way to kind of get out of this box of always using this report based criterion report-based measure as the criterion. We can go back and forth. So this is kind of an exploratory approach that uh, Alka has, has pioneered uh, over the years and work that he's done. Um, so key points from this is that this process is iterative in two way. The rating measure that we're talking about of the trait or disorder serves as an initial referent for identifying physiological indicators. But these indicators and their structure feedback to alter the rating measure, how we conceptualize it, and we may end up developing more than one scale to, uh, to try and co-vary with these families of, of physiological indicators. So it allows for trait or disorder concepts or constructs to be reshaped, in this case by physiological data. And this shift in the psychological concept of the trait or disorder can improve ties to and prediction of variables in other modalities so as we shift our idea of the construct and the way of conceptualizing and measuring it more to something that connects up with physiology, we're going to be able to predict other physiological measures more effectively if they fall into that family of physiologic measures that relate to the process that that set is, 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 is associated with. So the idea is to kind of work back and forth to, to uh, identify measures that are getting at something more specific and think about what that means psychologically. And this would be a kind of a model-based depiction. I'm going to show you an actual model in a minute here. But th this is uh, an example of how we could arrive at a multi-method measurement model where we have uh, rating measures that correlate together to define a latent uh, trait or disorder factor. So that would be the sub-factor in the model there on the, on the left. And then physiologic measures that relate to one another to define a factor. And the reason this is a multi-method um, measurement of a construct is because there's covariance between one subfactor and the other such that they go together to form a higher order factor that we could think of as a hybrid psychological, report-based, and physiologically-based construct. So that's kind of the idea that we want to, that, I, that we're, we've been working on, moving towards. And you could begin also to think about task behavioral indicators of that construct. Could be anxiousness, could be depressivity. I'm going to talk about other examples in a minute here. And if we added in behavioral indicators for another domain factor, then we would have this, this type of model. So the higher order factor at the top, you can think of as a representation of the individual difference characteristic you started with, but now it's kind of been shaped to accommodate data across those domains. So it's reflecting not just what the scales measure anymore, but how the scales interface with both behavior and physiologic response into something that we could think of as a more of a psychobiological um, dimension of variation. Um, I, I have lots of time, so maybe I'll stop and see if people have any questions at this point before I get into illustrating this.
Okay, well, I hope, hopefully the idea will become more con concrete as I talk about some examples. So as I mentioned, the first order factors, the lower order factors in this model are method specific factors, being uh, rating based measures, task behavioral measures, and physiologic measures, could be brain or other physiology. And the higher order, second order factor is a multi-method individual difference dimension. So we can, we, can, we can think about ordering people along a dimension of variability that's related not just to what the report is, but also to their level of score on, on those other two um, sub-factors. They would influence the person's overall position on this multi-method dimension. Okay, so I want to talk about specific examples of this, and the best worked out we have so far um, is a construct I'll call inhibitory control. Um, so again, the research strategy uh, that we're talking about is to use this second neurometric measurement approach, it's kind of an iterative back and forth exploratory approach, to bring together physiological and behavioral indicators with self-report indicators into a measure of a construct. And from that, we would develop multi-method models for measuring constructs of interest that can help us to link clinical symptom dimensions with neurobehavioral systems concepts and measures. And there's a lot of dimensional approaches to psychopathology, and you can kind of take your pick. But one recent one that's been discussed a lot is a hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology, the high top model. And this is, you could think of as kind of a synthesis of a lot of work looking at dimensional approaches to characterizing um, clinical symptom data and bring it together into one sort of general model of psychopathology. And if you go to this Journal of Abnormal Psychology article from 2017, which has been cited a lot, you can kind of see what, the, um, what this hierarchical dimensional model looks like. In the work I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on some major parts of this, uh, which would be uh, a part of the internalizing spectrum that encompasses fear and distress disorders. So that's kind of one realm of disorders that, um, very common disorders, fear and distress disorders. And on the other hand, um, disorders especially that relate to externalizing problems. And in the high-top high, uh, high top model, externalizing is divided into more disinhibitory externalizing, which is substance problems, ADHD, some aspects of uh, conduct problems, and then more antagonistic or callous externalizing, which is more kind of psychopathic, uh, aggressive conduct problems. So the neurobehavioral traits that I'll talk about would be ones that would be especially relevant to those types of disorders, which people have talked about as the most common types of mental disorders. Um, so basically what I'm doing is I'm taking those, you can see the, the um, not the higher order dimension, which people think of as a P factor, but the next level down we have internalizing, disinhibited, and antagonistic and externalizing. And those are the domains I'm going to major, I'm going to focus on mainly. I have detachment in here. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but more internalizing and externalizing. So the issue here that I started with is, is that measure, the high top model constructs are almost always measured through um, ratings or self-report. So we can say these are variables, symptom measures of these types are variables in the domain of symptom report. And we're interested in connecting up those clinical symptom dimensions with neurobehavioral systems. Uh, so that's another domain or modality of, of measurement and conceptualization in the neurobehavioral systems domain. And in that domain, we can think of constructs like defensive withdrawal, uh, integrating animal and human literature, defensive withdrawal, which relates to fear and inhibitory um, responding. Appetitive approach is another um, biological systems concept. Cognitive regulatory process is what we think of as more executive or frontal brain processes. And affiliative bonding is another neurobehavioral um, sort of domain that we can talk about. So the idea we have is, is that we would go at trying to, to conceptualize and quantify constructs that would reside between these domains, what we're going to call neurobehavioral trait constructs, of threat sensitivity, which I mentioned already, reward sensitivity is another one, inhibitory control, uh, which would relate most to this kind of EF frontal uh, function, and caring versus callousness. 
these would be our sort of intermediary trait concepts that would relate uh, to this. We could see the relationships with, their, with disorders as well as relationships with neural measures. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with scale measures of those constructs. And as I'll talk about, there are lots of scale measures of these constructs available now, especially the threat sensitivity, inhibitory control, and caring, caring versus callousness. Um, we've spent, we and other people, including Martin, have spent a lot of time developing scales to get at these constructs using MMPI items, MPQ items, NEO items, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different ways of measuring these constructs through self-report. But that's only part of it because we also want to be able to identify neurophysiological indicators of these constructs, which would be designated by the green, um, the little green squares, and task behavioral uh, indicators of those constructs. And it's the report-based measures of those constructs that are connect going to connect the model the most strongly to the symptom report domain. Measures within the same modality of measurement are going to relate the most strongly. So if we can in part operationalize our construct through report-based measures, that's going to facilitate the connection with the clinical symptom variables, which are also report-based. The reason to include physiological and task behavioral measures is, is to enhance the connection or the linkage with the neurobehavioral systems domain. And again, we're going we're gonna to sort of shape these constructs to lie in a zone in between these, these domains as effectively as possible. So we're actually creating and shaping new constructs that would serve as kind of linkages or bridges from uh, kind of a symptom, sort of a conventional uh, report-based symptom measures to neurobiological and behavioral variables that would connect up with um, neural systems constructs. So one uh, model that we developed, which was just published in 2018 in clinical psych science, which is the most well-developed of these, is a model of the construct of inhibitory control as it relates to externalizing problems. Um, so I'm going to show you what that model looks like. So this is essentially what I've illustrated a couple of times, but now actually with data. This is data for about 150 subjects, uh, which isn't a lot. So we definitely want to replicate this in larger samples. but. Um, it was based on a lot of work indicating that the measures that we chose would cohere together and should, should co cohere together around a higher order construct. So we have three types of indicators. We have a, a dis, disinhibition, we call it inhibition, disinhibition, or disinhibition construct. We have scale measures, and there are four of them listed here. I'll come back to this later. Again, I said there are multiple measures that you can find of these constructs now. And you can even develop them using items in, in existing data sets if you want to develop custom measures, and there's a procedure for that. So you can see the loadings of the individual scales on that scale factor are all very high, like 0.7 to 0.86. That's a very coherent scale factor of disinhibition. The middle, uh, <coughs> the middle uh, subfactor is defined by individual performance measures from four different tasks. And you would think of these as inhibitory control or executive function tasks. And they're behavioral tasks that, in, that require you to inhibit a prepotent response according to instructions. So one's the anti-saccade task, I'll just as an example. The anti-saccade task, a, a uh, asterisk appears on one side of a computer screen. And instead of orienting to the asterisk, which you normally would do automatically, you have to override that and look the opposite way. Because if you don't look fast enough, you'll miss a character that comes up on the opposite side of the screen, which you have to identify. So you have to override the automatic tendency to, to uh, look at the asterisk, instead look the other way fast enough. And people who do better at that would be lower inhibitory control or disinhibition. And people who do poorly on that would be higher in disinhibition. And then there are uh, other uh, tasks, like a stop signal task, a Stroop task, and a type of working memory task. Those variables uh, from these four different tasks do correlate with one another, and others have shown this as well. Um, not really, really strongly, but highly enough to form a factor that we can call, call a common disinhibition factor that reflects the covariance in common across these task behavioral indicators. And people have interpreted this as a task-based EF factor, or executive function factor. Miyake and Friedman, for instance, and others. And then the third uh, factor, the dis neuro factor, ERP factor, is defined by four variants of a brain response called the P3 response from three different tasks. So we're, we're pulling measures from different tasks that we have reason to believe will serve as indicators of um, 
of a common disinhibition factor, and we define subfactors, and then we can see that those we can see that those different indicators all load quite well onto a higher order inhibition disinhibition factor. The scale factor now only loads 0.4. The brain factor or DCRP factor loads uh, over minus 0.7 because higher disinhibition scores are associated with lower brain response and lower task performance. That's why the loadings for dis behavioral and dysneuro are negative. So the implication of this is that by doing this, we define a, a, a factor or dimension of inhibitory control that is actually more defined by variance in the brain and behavioral measures than in the self-report. And you could say, depending on your purposes, that can be good or bad. Uh, if you want to predict a lot of externalizing problems, the less that you weight the disinhibition scale, the weaker your correlation is going to get with problem variables. It'll still be there, but it'll be weaker. So this model is one that was, you know, run in, an, in a confirmatory way without a lot of constraints on it. If we actually constrain the loadings to be equal, such that the, uh, the second order factors all load equally on the higher order factor, uh, the model fits nearly just as well. Uh, and you actually increase the relationship of the factor scores 